Welcome to the first episode in a Legendarium series about the awful truth about fairy tales. And we'll start off with Pinocchio. Now, what would a children's story written by a man who hated children look like? We actually get a pretty good idea in the 1883 book The Adventures of Pinocchio, written by Carlo Collati. During the presentation, we'll talk about how this unusual fairy tale was created, the Italy of Carlo Collati, the original version of Pinocchio and how it was supposed to end, and the moral of Pinocchio's most famous adventure in Toyland. During his life as a journalist and author, Collati never had any children, likely because he didn't like children. Indeed, to judge from his writing, Collati harbored a particular dislike for boys. Indeed, almost every boy in The Adventures of Pinocchio is disobedient, greedy, and filthy. However, none is worse than Pinocchio. In his narration, Collati calls his legendary creation a rascal, imp, scapegrace, disgrace, ragamuffin, and confirmed rogue. And even his loving, long-suffering father Geppetto calls him wretched boy. Collati was born Carlo Lorenzini in Florence, Italy, November 24th, 1826. Later in life, he would choose Collati as his pen name after the hillside Tuscan village where his mother was born. And today, the village of Collati is home to the Park of Pinocchio, a destination for foreign tourists and local admirers alike. As a young man, Collati started his writing career with reviews to various music journals in Italy, such as La Italia Musicale. And after serving with the army during the Wars of Independence, Collati returned to writing by founding Il Lampione, a satirical newspaper. While operating Il Lampione, Collati tried to draw attention to the plight of Italy's poor. Indeed, southern Italy was so afflicted with foodlessness and cholera epidemics that close to a third of the population of southern Italy and Sicily would immigrate to the United States, Canada, and South America. However, in his 50s, Collati began writing stories for children, choosing to write for young readers as he found adults too hard to satisfy. He began publishing Pinocchio in a children's journal called Giornal dei Bambini in a series of short weekly installments, each in chapters of about 500 words. In some ways, this makes Collati's Adventures of Pinocchio very different from other iconic fairy tales. While most fairy tales have obscure origins and many versions created by generations of oral tradition, Pinocchio was written and published in a clearly documented historical era. Indeed, we can see some of Collati's social concerns in the book. At the very beginning, he notes that his fairy story is not about a king, but ordinary people struggling to make money. He also highlights the poverty of the man who creates Pinocchio, the woodcutter Geppetto, noting that Geppetto carves the puppet simply to make enough money putting on shows so that he can buy a crust of bread and a cup of wine. If a modern reader is mainly familiar with the 1940 film adaptation, one thing that would strike them immediately about the original book is that the character of Pinocchio is truly infuriating. From the beginning, Pinocchio causes terrible trouble for his creator and father, Geppetto. Even while he is still a pinewood block being carved, he kicks Geppetto in the leg. And when the patient Geppetto tries to teach Pinocchio to walk, the puppet thanks him by running into the street and making a ruckus. And when Geppetto attempts to retrieve his wayward puppet son, Pinocchio lies to a police officer, claiming that Geppetto is abusing him, and the police officer immediately arrests Geppetto. Here, Pinocchio begins to suffer the consequences of his bad behavior, and not for the first time. As Pinocchio searches his father's house for something to eat, a talking cricket warns Pinocchio that his poor choices will bring him nothing but misery. And in an act symbolic of killing conscience, Pinocchio hurls a mallet at the wall, crushing the talking cricket like a fly. And later on in the story, Pinocchio will be haunted by the ghost of said talking cricket. Despite quieting his conscience, Pinocchio is still not free from consequence. He still can't find food. Hungry and afraid, Pinocchio falls asleep with his wooden feet by the fire and wakes up to find his feet reduced to blackened stumps. This frightening episode shows two of Collati's likely influences, Heinrich Hoffmann and Hilary Bullock, both of whom wrote children's stories in which bad things happen to bad children. However, Collati takes his brutal punishments of Pinocchio much further than either of those authors ever imagined. 
Now, one would only hope that when Pinocchio gets a second chance when Geppetto is left out of prison, that Pinocchio would take it. At first, Pinocchio appears ready to reform, promising that he will go to school. And despite the harsh weather, Geppetto sells his coat to raise the money needed to buy Pinocchio a spelling book. Pinocchio heads off to school the next day, promising to make a good living one day and support his father in his old age, at least until he hears tunes from the musical theater. And without a second thought, Pinocchio rushes to the hall, sells Geppetto's hard-earned school book, and buys entry into the music hall with the money. This rank ingratitude to his father, who sacrificed the clothes on his back to help Pinocchio, is truly striking. And indeed, Collati had every intention of ending his book as a tragedy, a warning to boys about the consequences of this kind of behavior. In a series of misadventures that follow Pinocchio selling his school book for money, Pinocchio falls in with a pair of con men called the Cat and the Fox. They convince Pinocchio that if he buries his father's money in a magic field, a money tree will grow. And despite repeated warnings that the two con men are nothing but that, Pinocchio still trusts them until they lure him to an isolated place in the countryside and try to steal his gold. When Pinocchio resists, the cat and the fox take their revenge by hanging him. Halati intended to end his children's novel with the words, a tempestuous northerly wind began to blow and roar angrily, and it beat the poor puppet from side to side, making him swing violently, like the clatter of a bell ringing for a wedding. And the swinging gave him atrocious spasms. His breath failed him, and he could say no more. He shut his eyes, opened his mouth, stretched his legs, gave a long shudder, and hung stiff and insensible. And this is how Kaladi intended to end his children's book. However, over the course of the last 15 weeks, his young readers had become quite attached to the mischievous puppet. They sent anguished letters to the editor, begging for Pinocchio to be brought back to life, and Collati's editor, with some effort, convinced Collati to give the troublesome puppet a second chance at life. And so, the fairy with turquoise hair brought Pinocchio back to life, taking him to her house. However, even then, Pinocchio was being difficult, refusing to take his medicine until the fairy with turquoise hair summoned a team of undertaker rabbits to load him into a hearse. And that's what it took to convince Pinocchio to take his medicine and promise to reform. However, Pinocchio would go through several other cycles of promising to reform, failing to do so, and then being punished. Pinocchio's tortures become ever more brutal, including starvings, beatings, burnings, and even being forced to be a dog for a while. But in the book's most famous example, a boy named Candlewick convinces Pinocchio to travel to a country called Toyland, where everyone plays all day, summer vacation lasts from January 1st to December 31st, and children eat sweets three meals a day. A man named the Coachman takes the children in a carriage lined with whipped cream, custard, and vanilla wafers to Toyland, where Pinocchio, Candlewick, and the other bad children play and play and play until they are suddenly turned into donkeys and they are sold as slave labor to farms and salt mines. Indeed, Pinocchio finds himself sold to a circus and forced to do tricks while wearing dresses until he sprains his ankle. And the circus master throws him into the ocean to drown him, but after yet another escape at thanks to the good fairy, Pinocchio finds Candlewick worked to death by a farmer. And this served as social commentary, noting that children who skipped school would find themselves in grueling manual labor and that men like the coachman would be all too happy to take advantage of them. And this strange combination of a character, both wish fulfillment device and cautionary tale, has helped to keep Pinocchio relevant for 150 years. And if you're interested in learning more about original fairy tales, check out my book on Amazon Kindle, The Terrible Truth About Fairy Tales, with the link in the description. Thanks again for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.